Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and host. Last month, The Atlantic published an article titled Beyond Originalism, written by Adrian Vermeule, who's a professor of constitutional law at Harvard. In this piece, Vermeule argues that, quote, the dominant conservative philosophy for interpreting the Constitution, originalism, has served its purpose, and scholars ought to develop a more moral framework, unquote. Vermeule's proposal here is not new and is gaining traction on the right. Originalist interpretations of the Constitution simply no longer serve the common good, he says. But what does he mean by this? And is he correct? In this episode, we are featuring two different conversations on this topic, both hosted by Acton's Eric Cohn. First, Randy Barnett, who's a professor at Georgetown University, clears up some of the legal theory behind Vermeule's essay. Then to close, David French, who's a senior editor at The Dispatch, helps break down the context surrounding these calls for conservative activism on the courts. Both guests have written responses to Vermeule's piece, which I will be linking in the show notes for this episode, which you can read at blog.acton.org. That's blog.acton, A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G. I'm joined now by Randy Barnett, who is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at Georgetown University Law. He is also the director of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. In his most recent book, An Introduction to Constitutional Law, 100 Supreme Court Cases Everyone Should Know, was published in 2019. Randy, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me on the show and uh, looking forward to our talk. So your piece in The Atlantic was titled Common Good Constitutionalism Reveals the Dangers of Any Non-Originalist Approach to the Constitution. Uh, perhaps we should start with some definition setting before we get into the Adrian Vermeule piece beyond originalism that you were responding to with what is originalism? Sure, I can summarize originalism in one sentence, and that is the meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. So the Constitution, there are two premises to originalism beyond that one sentence definition. One is that there is a fixed meaning of a text. When a text is is, uh, uh, ratified or promulgated, it has a meaning. If you write a letter to somebody, it has a fixed meaning at the time you wrote it. If the the text has a meaning at the time it was promulgated, um, that's an empirical claim about texts and meaning. And then it has a norm. There's a normative component to originalism that said constitutional actors uh, ought to be ought to be bound or ought to uh, make their decisions based on that text. So that originalism has a descriptive component and it has a normative component. Now the descriptive component is based on linguistics and other fancy stuff like that. The normative component um, can be based on a number of different moral arguments for why the original meaning should be followed by constitutional actors. There's quite a, there's quite a number of them and they're not mutually inconsistent. So you don't necessarily have to pick one. You, they reinforce each other, but that's originalism in a nutshell. The meaning of the constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed. And I guess, let me just offer a similar uh, brief normative argument for originalism, uh, and that is that the Constitution is not the law that governs us. The Constitution is the law that governs those who govern us. And if that's true, those who are to be governed by the Constitution can no more change its meaning without going through the amendment process than we can change, we can properly change the meaning of the laws they make to govern us without going through the legislative process. So that's it, it's interesting you frame it that way, because as we get into Adrian Vermeule's piece, uh, it seems that he has almost an inherent rejection of the concept of the Constitution built into it, because he speaks not of what is, to me, the fundamental understanding of the American system of governments, that we are citizens, not subjects. He speaks in there very clearly of subjects and rulers, and the concept behind his proposal for common good constitutionalism is a means to empowering strong rule in favor of the common good. Do do you think this is what he's doing? Oh, absolutely. And he uses the word subjects freely in the piece. Um, But, you know, one of the problems with this piece in the Atlantic is that it 
it assumes or asserts, depending on what we're, which one we're talking about, either assumes or it asserts so much theory uh, without really coming to grips either with the theories that are being assumed or asserted or any objections to them that it is just it's you know it's really hard to interpret or it 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 it, it requires the reader to bring to bear all of the reader's understanding of all the different theories that these that this this essay are implicating even though he doesn't really wrestle with them himself. And this is just one of them. Are we citizens? Are we subjects? What does it mean to be a citizen? Um, the government is the government our servant? Um, and or are, is the government our master? Is the government our ruler? And, and um, look, uh, I think that this is a repudiation. Uh, this position is a repudiation of the founding document that made the that constituted the United States as a polity, which is the Declaration of Independence. So what did that say? It said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Each one of those are individual rights, rights that Adrian Vermeule would associate with what he calls liberalism. And then the next sentence of that declaration says, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That is the American theory of government, which is that government exists to secure the pre-existing individual rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what government is there for. And it's to be measured against that standard. Um, all of this is implicitly rejected by Adrian Vermeule. In the early part of his article in The Atlantic, the third paragraph, he says, originalism has now outlived its utility and has become an obstacle to the development of a robust, substantially conservative approach to constitutional law and interpretation. Such an approach, one might call it common good constitutionalism, should be based on the principles that government helps direct persons, associations, and society generally toward the common good. So I think there are two interesting things in here. One, he seems to be suggesting that originalism itself is only a kind of utilitarian tool that was rhetoric or a position held by its proponents for the maximization of their political power when they were out of it. Uh, as well, he seems to talk about this idea of common good constitutionalism without seeming to define clearly what this common good actually is. Uh, do, do you think I have it correct there? Uh, I think both of those are right. Um, let me talk, take about, talk about each one of them uh, uh, in turn. So as for the first one, um, that he says essentially that originalism was a rhetorical device for those out of power, this is actually a criticism, a widespread criticism made of originalism by non-originalists, by generally progressive or left-wing non-originalists, where they say, oh, well, this, you know, uh, judges in particular, judges, they're usually willing to cut slack to academics. But with respect to judges, they say they're just mouthing this commitment to originalism. This is just a cover for them pursuing an ideological agenda. Um, I guess it's no surprise, as I say in my uh, my response to Adrian's piece in The Atlantic, that Adrian mouths this non-originalist criticism of originalism because he's a, a non-originalist himself. So just because Adrian... If he ever did assert originalism, and I don't know that he ever did, might have done it for strategic reasons. Um, that doesn't mean other originalists are doing it for strategic reasons. So uh, I think he's wrong about why people are doing it, although I guess he could be right by, about somebody, some of them. But I don't think he's generally right. And he need, and it need not be correct. So the second point um, was the common good. And here's the thing that more generally, people who are talk about the common good, you know, and reject what they call liberalism, uh, overlook, and that is that one of the principal claims for liberal for, for individual rights is that they are absolutely essential to securing the common good. That you can't concern, you can't, you cannot, and that's the way. And they were defended in such terms when they were introduced into uh, the political lexicon during the Enlightenment. That is that. The respect for individual rights is an, inis is an inescapable, absolutely necessary uh, means of, preser of preserving and protecting and advancing the common good. And if you try to do that, advance some notion of a common good without doing that, you will not achieve the common good. 
that meets Adrian's claim on the merits. But first, I think it's incumbent upon him to make his claim, which he hasn't done. What you talked about previously with regard to the Declaration of Independence, it, it seems that this common good approach is reflects a collectivization of what has in to originalists and, and really to anyone I think who's read American history understands as the individual nature of rights within the constitutional understanding that it's the right to pursue happiness from an individual or really a family level. Uh, as opposed to this kind of common good conception that seems to be a full, almost national collectivization of that idea. Right. Well, this idea, that goes way back. That's nothing new. Um, In fact, it's the subject of my previous book, Our Republican Constitution, Securing the Liberty and Sovereignty of We the People. And in that book, I outline uh, two conceptions of popular sovereignty based on two conceptions of we the people. We the people as individuals and we the people as a group. If you take the view of we the people as a group, which is a view that I do think existed you know, at the time of the founding, it was not unknown, although it didn't become really popular until after the founding into the 1820s and 1830s, when it became the basis of the new Democratic Party. Uh, but if you take individual, if you take we the people as a group, and we the people as a group are sovereign, then the only way, and, and the sovereign will, is to prevail, which is what sovereignty typically is about, sovereign will, um, then the only way you can ascertain what the sovereign will is, is by asking what a majority of the collective we wants. And so it ends up leading to a majoritarian vision of we the people uh, collectively. Alternatively, there's we the people as individuals, and that's the philosophy I identify and uh, from the, uh, in the Declaration of Independence, and there's, that's why there's a chapter on the Declaration in my book. Because I think that's where the individual conception of popular sovereignty, that we're citizens, uh, that we are the sovereigns as individuals, and then the government exists among us. That does It's not us, but it, it, governments ex- are established among men, um, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Um, and then government must be subordinate to the rights of the people who are their their masters. So governments are the agents and the, and the people are the principles and the agents must be subordinated to the rights of the principles whose interests they are bound to serve. Do you see Vermeule's argument here as an embrace of the, a conservative embrace of the living constitution concept that the constitution is um, a document that if you squint at it as if it's a Rorschach test, you can find in it pretty much anything you want in the uh, emanations or the penumbra of all of it. Um, do, do you think that that is, I mean, really fundamentally what this is, is an embrace of the kind of living constitution concept that says we can find in there whatever meaning we want and is necessary, and that it's usually connected to a uh, desire for political power at any given moment? Um, yes, he embraces. Look, there are a lot of theories of living constitutionalism. There is not just one. I mean, oftentimes I'll just talk about non-originalist theories, and then you know, also known as living constitutionalist theories. Uh, and so, Adrian in this piece just adopts um, one of those versions, which is called the moral readings approach, which he associates accurately with Ronald Dworkin, who was also my professor of jurisprudence at Harvard when I was a student there. Um, And this moral readings approach is basically that you make the Constitution the best it can be by reading into the text um, uh, what are the what is the morally preferable principles to be there. Um, Where those principles come from exactly. I mean, Dworkin's an objectivist when it comes to morality. He's not a relativist. And where he gets them from, you know, I'm not exactly sure. But um, this is what you're this is what you're supposed to do. And Adrian adopts that expressly, says he's following his just adopting the Dworkinian model uh, without considering any of the weaknesses of that model um, or the and or even explaining why he's adopting it. It's just it's convenient to him. And what do you think the weaknesses of that model are? Well, for one thing, it's the one that I uh, note in my response to Adrian, and that is um, uh, whose morality uh, is going to be used when you're giving it a, when you're using a moral readings, which morality are you talking about? And the way these things are going to be decided, it's going to be either it's going to be a judge, the judges, all things considered moral judgment, 
then is going to be imposed on the legislature or, or the people generally. Or if you want to take a judicial restraint approach, then it's going to be the legislature's view of morality, which a lot of conservatives would favor. Um, and that means it's basically going to be the individual legislator's view. Now, legislation is spo- legislators are supposed to act uh, non-arbitrarily. That is, we're, we're supposed to do what they say, not just because they want us to, but because they have good reasons for us, justifiable, proper reasons. So what are the justifiable? How will we know? How will anybody know? But the justifiable, proper reasons for uh, morality-based legislation is purely morality-based legislation if, without any consideration of harm to others. And the answer is they're not going to ha- – What are their, their, the debate they have in the statehouse is not going to be a moral debate. You're not going to get f- philosophical arguments from state legislators. I know state legislators. I like them. I respect them. They are not moral philosophers. You're not going to get arguments like that. You're not going to get arguments like that in their committee hearings either. What are you going to get? You're going to get a vote. And each each legislator is simply going to vote their moral preferences, their moral views. And that's arbitrary because it's not going to be based on reason. It's going to be based on their the moral in conclusions each legislator reaches. And then the majority's morality gets imposed on the minority. Well, that's, first of all, arbitrary. It violates the due process of law because it's arbitrary. Um, and it is an invitation to social uh, conflict and disruption and moral and religious wars, which is what that sort of attitude has always led towards. So that's just some of the problems. And as for your, you know, as for how similar he is to living constitutionalism, I'll just quote you this part of his essay. He says, this approach should take it as starting point, substantive moral principles that conduce to the common good, principles that officials, including but by no means limited to judges, should read into, read into the majestic generalities and ambiguities of the written constitution. And that is absolutely a living, a standard living constitutionalist move. And before we move on, let me just say, there's just nothing original in this piece. This piece, it's going to get, it's getting a lot of play, um, but there's, it, 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 it lacks really any originality. It is taking a Dworkinian moral readings approach and it's simply importing into it Adrian's moral approach. Um, now, it's not his theory. He's using somebody else's theory. And then later on in the piece, when he talks about the strategic uh, uh, views, he's basically importing his colleague Mark Tushnet's views, uh, strategic views, his critical legal studies type views. Um, but there's nothing particularly theoretically interesting or original here. What's interesting and original is just that you have a Harvard law professor saying these things in the pages of the Atlantic. I think that's interesting. The question I wanted to ask is, uh, in, in part, where do you think this is coming from? Largely because I think if you look at the way, you know, my, myself as an observer of the political scene and, and as such the uh, judicial branch. Um, we've heard a lot of talk over the last three and a half years about the judges who have been confirmed under um, the United States Senate and uh, nominated by Donald, President Donald Trump, um, many of whom we believe, uh, largely because of the involvement of the Federalist Society, are originalist judges. Um, and we've seen, or at least I had believed, that there is somewhat of a conservative contentment with you know, kind of where society had gotten to, where the legal system had gotten to, where you have these uh, who at least we're likely to believe are more originalist judges. Um, so I understand what you're saying about this not being revolutionary or really offering anything new in terms of legal theory. But where do you think that this desire to take what, uh, at least amongst, I think, many people had been perceived as progress uh, in the judiciary and kind of now turn it on its head with this desire to read into the Constitution kind of whatever you want to see in there in the name of this undefined common good? Well, it's a very important question because this is not just Adrian Vermeule. If this were just Adrian Vermeule, I might not have even responded to it. But I know that there is kind of a small, very small, but, uh, 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 but still an existent element of discontent that sort of uh, uh, burbling up uh, from social conservatives in particular. And this is a just one part 
of the sort of much larger and much more well-known pushback against uh, mainstream or establishment conservatism generally. So which is what is represented by people who um, support Donald Trump, not all people who support Donald Trump take this view. And, and I'm not sure. I don't know what Donald Trump's view is, but a lot, a number of people who have, you, you know, have used the Trump presidency as a as a way of arguing against what they call conservative Inc. or establishment conservatives who have. And here's their complaint who have failed to deliver on their promise and will always fail to deliver on their promise because there's something wrong with the program that they are seeking to implement. Some of it is because of personal things that they're, they're establishment folks themselves and they enjoy Georgetown cocktail parties and all the rest. But some of it has to do with the inherent limitations of their approach uh, to governance as well. And that's when you see this pivot into something like a commitment to tradition and conservatism in that sense a traditionalist approach as opposed to what what they call a liberal approach, which is based on individual rights um, and the principles of our founding. It, it strikes me as there's almost a, a complaint about, uh, I want to say it's a misunderstanding of originalism, but that, you know, I've, I've heard speeches from um, Clarence Thomas and, and I've read just a uh, just the late Justice Scalia on this as well, who have talked about their judicial philosophies. I know there are varying strains of um, originalism or textualism between the two of them and between a lot of judges, but that they would openly say that sometimes the approach that they believe is the correct approach, their originalist or textualist approach, leads them to legal decisions that they don't personally, by, you know, by their own individual personal views, don't like the outcome of. But that that is what the Constitution says, and that if there is a desire to change that, we can amend the Constitution. Uh, it, it, I, I find it interesting. The it, it seems to be an uh, an argument about results rather than the importance of the process. That I think, as you alluded to earlier, that the importance of of these liberal institutions that we have are not necessarily to produce certain results that groups of people may desire. It really is to stop people from killing each other over their disagreements, rather whether they be you know, political or religious or sectarian of any kind. Yeah, this discontent is absolutely what we what what conservatives used to call result oriented jurisprudence. That's what it is. It's that's it's nothing other than that. Originalism is only to be supported insofar as it delivers the results we want. To the extent it doesn't or it hasn't, it is to be qualified or rejected in the case of Adrian Vermeule. I mean, they don't always not some of these these people that I've talked to or that I've read who have who are manifesting this discontent are oftentimes credit junior people. They're they're young people um, and um, uh, they don't necessarily get up and say reject and repudiate originalism because that would be you know a difficult thing for them to pull off. But this Harvard law professor can say it. And now that he said it, I think they're more likely to say it than they were once before. But and a lot of these folks are being attracted to this national conservatism um, initiative. It's not it's too early to call it a movement yet, but it could be a movement. Um, and they had their founding meeting last fall um, uh, at the Ritz Carlton Hotel in Washington. It was a big meeting. As ironically, this populist meeting was at the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Um, and I spent two days there. Uh, I paid for my for my registration because I wanted to see exactly for myself what they were up to. Um, and that's when there, and I saw these folks were there. And, and that's just sort of like part of what was going on there. They're attracted to this idea of uh, nationalism uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but these this it's it's an interesting development. Um, and it's a it's a major challenge to the Federalist Society itself. Uh, the Federal Society is a coalition of conservatives and libertarians who uh, have coalesced around a view of the Constitution, which is, as you say, not purely result oriented, but based on the text of the Constitution. We take the Constitution as we find it, and we think it, and we also think it's a good Constitution. Unlike progressives who don't like the Constitution, we actually think it's a good one, and in part, it's a good one because it leads to good results. But that, but the means to these results is following the Constitution. That's the Federal Society coalition model. Um, this is what is actually being objected to 
Um, and in fact, libertarians are made by these by these folks, the whipping boy of this everything that's been wrong with conservatism, that conservatism has been hijacked by libertarians, that originalism has been hijacked by libertarians. I'm a libertarian, so I am an exhibit A of how originalism has been hijacked by libertarians. Um, so they oftentimes use me as an example. Um, and, and, and that's the problem. And so if you go at the National, Con- 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 uh, the National Conservatism uh, Conference, every 20 or 30 minutes or so, there would just be whoever was speaking would just have a gratuitous slight sl- slap at libertarians, even if it wasn't even relevant to what they were saying, because that's who, uh, that's who, who the bad guys are in the story. You conclude your piece by saying, we can all be grateful to Vermeule for firing so visible a shot across the originalist bow. Forewarned is forearmed. Recall this passage from Justice Scalia's dissenting opinion in Morrison v. Olson. Frequently an issue will come before the court clad, so to speak, in sheep's clothing. The potential of the asserted principle in effect in Uh, to effect important change in the equilibrium of power is not immediately evident and must be discerned by a careful and perceptive analysis. But this wolf comes as a wolf. There is nothing subtle or surreptitious about the challenge common good constitutionalism uh, poses to originalism. This wolf comes as a wolf. Randy Barnett, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Eric. On June 27, 2018, the Supreme Court issued its 5-4 decision in favor of Mark Janus in Janus v. American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees. This landmark case was a victory for First Amendment rights, ruling that government employees can no longer be compelled to pay union fees as a condition of working in public service. The Acton Institute is pleased to host Mark Janis at an upcoming event on August 20 in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He'll be joining us for a moderated conversation on this historic case and his move from public sector employee to advocate for workers' rights. Learn more about this event and save your seat today at acton.org slash events. I'm joined now by David French, who is the senior editor at The Dispatch and the author of the French Press newsletter from The Dispatch, as well as the uh, co-host of the Advisory Opinions podcast, along with Sarah Isger. David, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So I read with great interest your Against Christian Authoritarianism newsletter from the dispatch, uh, which is addressing Adrian Vermeule's article in the Atlantic, but I think addressing it uh, almost, almost setting aside the originalist, the constitutional arguments, which I think are important, but taking a look at the political nature of Vermeule's argument. Um, David, in your opinion, where, where do you think this argument from Vermeule is coming from? Is this kind of part of this kind of cleaving of uh, political opinion on the political right in just kind of a more radical form than we've seen before? Well, you know, I've been dealing with some version of this argument for, gosh, almost a year now (laughs) when it's, when, um, there was the article published in first things called against David Frenchism by Saurabh Amari, who, while probably doesn't agree with Adrian Vermeule on everything, it would be considered sort of a fellow traveler with Vermeule. Um, and I, I think what's happening here is you have a few things hap- uh, coming into play at once. One, there is a real sense that the culture is slipping away. American culture is slipping away. Uh, that culture war has been lost. Uh, in other words, that all you're going to see over you know the next years, months, years, and decades is a continued advancement of secular progressivism. So that culture war is lost. Uh, number two, that one of the reasons why the culture war is lost is because of the American structure of government, of classical liberalism, which put, puts such a premium on individual liberty. And number three, that really the only thing the right has been able to do effectively over the last 30, 40 years is win political power. And so therefore, if we want to save our country, um, then we have to use political power to the maximum extent to reverse cultural decline. 
And you take those three things and you're you're going to be veering more towards an authoritarian view of government, whether it's full on integralism, which, um, you know, the longer definitions, but more or less integrates within church and state, the teachings and philosophy, political philosophies of the Catholic church. Um, although, you know, if there's a lot of uh, dispute about what many of those philosophies might be, but uh, more integration of church and state, specifically the Catholic church and state, whether it's full-on integralism or whether it is just sort of a more of a religiously informed populist authoritarianism, that's kind of the impulse. Cultural loss um, due to classical liberalism that must be reversed through political power. It's sort of the, the, the core of the of the complaint so it, it would seem to me that for those who would make socially conservative arguments that um to, to back up to something you were just saying it strikes me that both sides of this argument believe that they're in a culture war and i think we could probably concede that they're both right about that but they both seem to perceive that they're losing and that's it, that's interesting to me in that there's not a clear sense from either the left or the right that, you know, they're, they're winning or losing. And I think that's in part because of the nature of the American political system. Um, and I think why, at least in my opinion, it seems Vermeule is going after originalism like this, because it's this kind of neutral uh, way of in, neutral marketplace way of interpreting what the Constitution means, that the Constitution says something, and it's very much a, a, a means argument. It's not about the ends. And because it's not about the ends, that seems to be informing some of the consternation that they're having, uh, because it doesn't necessarily guarantee that the outcomes that are going to come from an originalist interpretation of the Constitution are outcomes that they would like. But they seem to want to now replace it with something that's more certain that we'll know the outcomes we're going to like, but it also opens up the possibility of the same mechanisms of power being used against them. Does that, that make sense to you? Right. I mean, it's, you know, anytime you're veering towards authoritarianism and away from localism, for example, federalism, for example, uh, veering away from individual liberty, um, you're kind of hoping that your side wins <laughs> all the time. That that you that those who are controlling the levers of power will always be friendly to you because the structures you create that overcome individual liberty, that overcome localism or federalism, are the exact structures that would then be used against you with with all due energy uh, if and when you lose your election. Um, but I, I want to back up a little bit here because you raised a really good point, which was both sides believe that they're engaged in a, cult, a cultural war, cultural conflict, and they both think they're losing. And when you say this into a conservative audience, often the response is, those people are nuts. They're just nuts. If anyone, a, a person on the left who thinks they're losing is crazy, of course we're, they're winning. They, they have all of the high ground of the academy. They have pop culture, um, woke capitalism is you know winning the day but when you when you actually look at a lot of the the data around american not just attitudes but actions um i i go back to a formulation that my friend ramesh pernuru stated gosh i can't remember how long ago but it, in the last few years he said if you look at the arc of america um over the last several decades it has become more pro-life it has become more pro-gun and has become more pro-gay. And I think each one of those three things is true. And so if you look, if you go back to say 1986, you will have seen that the abortion rate in the United States is very, very high compared to what it is now, right? Right now it is lower than it was when Roe versus Wade was decided. The abortion rate was very, very high. Restrictions on gun rights were coast to coast nationwide. And there was no real such thing as a gay rights movement. I mean, it was it barely existed. Um, and since that time, the abortion rate has plummeted, as I said, to a low below Roe v. Wade. The number of pro-life laws passed just in the last five years of the Obama administration. Let, let's just leave aside the Trump administration. Last five years of the Obama administration, 
more pro-life laws passed than at any time since Roe uh, in a concentrated period of time. Um, and you've had also at the same time, uh, you've had the growth of the gay rights movement, which is also in, now including LGBT with you know the trans movement, et cetera. And so what ends up happening is if you're on the left, you're going to look at abortion rights under siege, gun rights spreading from coast to coast, and you're saying, what on earth has happened? And if you're on the right, you're going to say, wait a minute, what is this? What is going on with this Caitlyn Jenner stuff and Title IX and uh, boys participating in girls' sports and woke capitalism, making you know, uh, taking an aim at religious liberty? And so each side has this has a big issue that they really care about, where they have been in retreat for a long time. And so it isn't as cut and dry by any stretch of the imagination as sort of the the integralist authoritarian critique would have it. The culture war picture is very much more mixed. Well, the, there's a fundamental, it's interesting to me in Vermeule's piece that uh, part of what he says needs to be rejected is somewhat of an economic libertarian understanding of the world. And part of that economic libertarian understanding, at least to me, has always been the idea that there are trade-offs in everything that nirvana is not for this world. You're never going to have an unalloyed good, or I guess the inverse of that would be an alloyed bad. Um, there's going to be upsides to bad things and downsides to good things. Uh, so from the perspective of, say, a believing Catholic looking at the pro-life argument that you just made could be happy about the increase or the decrease in uh, the abortion rate, but would also look at the mainstreaming of um, contraception and other things the Catholic Church teaches against. Uh, and I guess the question really becomes, are you willing to accept the trade-offs inherent in that and make priorities even within kind of your own belief systems of what is more important to pursue at any given moment with the understanding that you're never going to get all of what you want? Yeah, I think that that's uh, when you're when you're arguing with the integralism, you're often arguing with you find yourself arguing with a sort of a vague sort of utopianism um, in which there will be a strong ruler, a strong central authority. They will have a conception of the common good of which there will be broad social consensus around it eventually, and they will know how to pursue its attainment and to do so effectively. I mean, these are some pretty big presumptions. Um, and, you know, one of the things that a, a more libertarian minded person would immediately respond with is not just you're neglecting trade-offs. Utopianism is, is a pipe has, is, and has always been a pipe dream, even a, even a soft form of utopianism, but there's also a strong objection as to who decides what is good for me economically, for example, who, who is it's going to, because when you're talking about the common good argument, or particularly in the economic realm, you're often talking about an awful lot of central planning and privileging of one form of profession over another form of profession, uh, striving for an ideal as, as defined by the planners, uh, workforce mix and workplace policies. And, you know, one of the things that a more libertarian model of economics does is it, it just it just rejects the ability of the central planner to either a do that competently or b do it in a way that's actually in my best interest and that they would know my better best interest better than i would and you know that's one of the problems that i have with this this formulation is that you're taking you're putting an enormous amount of power in the hands of a concentrated small number of people and asking them to create a, a coherent set of policies that I'm supposed to eventually conclude that they're, but just because they're working so darn well, are really best for me, regardless of my initial objections. And you see that that strain throughout Vermeule's essay. And again, this is not new. I mean, this is central planning, right? This is this is top down central planning of not just social policy, but top-down central planning of the most complex economy in the history of the world. And you'll have to excuse me if I'm skeptical <laughs> of the ability of the central planner to accomplish the common good in the way that they conceive. 
And as you note, Vermeule is explicit about this. From his essay, libertarian conceptions of property rights and economic rights will also have to go insofar as they bar the state from enforcing duties of community and solidarity in the use and distribution of resources. And this gets to exactly what you were saying and what Hayek identified as the knowledge problem of you, even if you get all the smartest people in the world in a room together, they can't possibly possess enough knowledge to be able to effectively determine where those resources go. And we almost we see a version of this right now in the reaction to the coronavirus pandemic, uh, because we have with the way we have anti price gouging laws do not allow prices to do the job that they're supposed to and communicate what resources are needed in places that actually need them. There's a perfectly fine to have a moral objection to incredibly high prices on goods in that place. But you also must accompany with an understanding, I think, uh, that prices communicate something that even the smartest people in a room together are not possibly going to be able to determine for everyone in the way Vermeule seems to allude to here. Well, you you raise a good point about coronavirus, separate and apart from pricing. Um, So... The United States of America is an incredibly large, incredibly geographically and diverse country. So you have cities like New York that are among the more densely populated places in the United in the world. And then you have places like Montana, incredibly it's sparsely been social populated. distancing from its inception. Yes. Or, you know, there's a big difference between suburban and rural. And and so we have we have 50 states, we have 50 state governors, and the founders in their wisdom said, look, the police power, uh, especially the police power over public health, resides with the state governments. Um, the federal government is a government of enumerated power. And so the way that works in practicality is the federal government, with all of its immense financial resources, essentially becomes like the logistician, the supply clerk to the states. And the states exercise the actual legal authority over the public health measures in place in their regions or in the, you know, in their cities, in their towns, in their states. And that allows local officials who are accountable to local uh, voting publics to make the decisions that are best suited for their population and for their situation. And, And we've seen different kinds of orders in different kinds of places And that is the system at work. And I'm much more skeptical of the ability of the federal government to determine a a uniform set of rules for everyone in the country or to be able to fine tune from central planning the rules in each region of the country that are best suited for both a combination of public safety and economic opportunity in each and every region. And again, this is this is one of the issues with authoritarianism. Authoritarianism devolves power to the top uh, and it places an extraordinary burden of expertise on an extraordinary, extraordinarily small number of people who are simply not capable in the most practical sense that they're just not up to that task. And and you know if we if we doubt that you know we have ample historical example uh, and you know here's one of the other things i think is is uh important to understand america is only becoming more complicated and more diverse it is not a society and economy that is becoming simpler and less diverse and so it is becoming i believe increasingly difficult to govern through a uniform, top-down, central-planned, statist approach. And yet that is exactly what this version of right-wing authoritarianism is proposing. What if we can back up to the cultural part you were talking about a few minutes ago and get you to weigh in on uh, this idea, that you talked about the ways in which, you know, the as Ramesh Panuro pointed out, that America has become uh, more pro-life, more pro-gun, and more pro-gay. Uh, and we coupled that with a conversation about how both sides of the culture war seem to think that they are losing it. How much do you think that is a product of how we're still learning to deal with the technological advancements of the last 15 to 20 years, where we really all have moved our lives online. And we feel closer to people who are further away from us 
uh, because of those connections. And I can, the, part of the great thing about these technological advancements is that I can, you know, as we're sheltering in place right now, I'm in Chicago and you're in Tennessee, we can talk to each other as, you know, almost as if we lived right next to each other. That's a great advancement, but we also gives us the opportunity to see all the people in so many different places around a country that, as you noted, is becoming more and more diverse who are quote unquote living wrong. And it kind of (laughs) pings this feeling inside of us to say they shouldn't be living that way. When I think the more proper reaction is to say, if California wants to be crazy, as long as it doesn't result in some kind of, you know, a federal bailout of the state of California or more perhaps the state of Illinois, which may fall first, as long as the bill doesn't come for that, let California be weird in their way and we can let Texas be weird in its own way. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the simplistic, the simple, although not simplistic, but the simple formulation of federalism. Let California be California. Let Tennessee be Tennessee. Um, Marsha Blackburn has far more influence over the lives of people in Nancy Pelosi's district uh, than they would like. And Nancy Pelosi has far more influence over the lives of Tennesseans than I would like. And I, you know, it, it sounds simplistic, but there's a marvelous beauty in that simplicity to local control of an extraordinarily geographically, ethnically, religiously, ideologically diverse population. There's just an enormous amount of virtue in that, so long as we protect the privileges or or immunities of each and every citizen in every state where, where federalism has failed. And look, critics of federalism can point to some pretty negative historical problems. (laughs) Uh, the, the slave states of the Confederacy, uh, the Jim Crow states of the con- old Confederacy, and where federalism has failed is where local control has become so powerful that it has overridden the fundamental privileges or immunities of citizenship in this country. So that if I cross state lines and I was a person of a particular, you know, Af- African American, that I fundamentally had different and inferior rights than other Americans. Well, if you have federalism that that protects the the fundamental civil rights of all Americans, yet allows for an enormous amount of local control over everything from um, fiscal policy to healthcare policy to environmental policy where appropriate, then you know at that point you you can really begin to achieve a kind of unity and diversity in the sense that we all can feel a part of the same American family because we share the fundamentals of the social compact and the Bill of Rights, but we also feel a high degree of control over our own political destinies because our votes count on the policies that really matter. And and right now, I mean, think about this, Eric. If I live in a non-swing state and in a gerrymandered district, House district, which is basically most of us in the United States of America, as the federal government becomes increasingly powerful on my life, I have decreasing input on its composition. And that is a recipe for trouble. Yes, this brings me to one of the things that I got out of Adrian Vermeule's essay, which is it's not just his rejection of originalism as a means, as a philosophy for interpreting the Constitution and what seems to me is his embrace of a conservative version of living constitutionalism, where it's essentially a Rorschach test that you can find pretty much anything you wanted to say in the emanations and the penumbra of the text there. Um, but also it it coincides to me with a rejection of liberalism in and of itself. And we've seen this from Patrick Deneen's book about why liberalism failed, which, um, if I may be so general as to say that the Adrian Vermeule and, and the people who seem to be uh, fellow travelers with him seem to be in support of this idea. Um, it, it strikes me that they're kind of missing the purpose of liberalism in the same way that Mule seems to be missing the point of originalism, that originalism is about the means of this is how we decide what the Constitution says based on the text and based on what we know of how it was passed, that there's a meaning to it. 
and we can change it if we want. And the purpose of liberalism is also not ends-based. It is not to produce a certain set of outcomes that we may like or that we may desire. But really, at its fundamental core, it's to stop us from going to war with each other over the way that we want to live our lives, whether that be differences in you know, morals, values, religious sectarian differences. It's a mechanism for allowing us to live together peacefully while we disagree with each other. Does that sound right to you? Yeah. So I think yes and. So first with the yes, I think that, um, and I, I wrote about this in, in my um, newsletter that I called Against Christian Authoritarianism, and is that liberalism emerged from the wars of religion and the aftermath of the wars of religion as essentially uh, almost, and I, I, I was quoting a, a person who writes under the pseudonym uh, Scott Alexander and really thought-provoking site called Slate Star Codex, which uh, odd name, but don't be put off by the name. Lots of interesting stuff in there. That essentially it's an incredibly um, fragile, fine-tuned mechanism for preventing civil war. Um, it's a mechanism that allows people who possess belief systems uh, that were so different enough that in previous centuries led to bloodletting on a terrible scale to not only live together in peace, but then this is the this is the yes and and flourish, flourish as individuals. And this is where I really object to the tension that a lot of the uh, more of uh, the authoritarian right sets up between liberalism and the common good. It's a false distinction. Liberalism, particularly the kind of liberalism, liberalism articulated in the Bill of Rights to the U.S. Constitution and the Civil War amendments passed after the Civil War, is I do represent a series of legal doctrines that are in the common good and by themselves produce human flourishing. Uh, so, for example, free speech. Free speech, Frederick Do Douglass called the First Amendment, or it called the right of free speech, the great moral renovator of society and government. And if, if there's been anything that's been proven true over the course of our history, it's that Free speech has been the enemy of injustice over time. That doesn't mean that all speech is good or that every person exercises the liberty, the, their liberties in the First Amendment responsibly. But the net effect of that liberty has been human flourishing on an extraordinary scale and the elimination of some injustices that have plagued, Amer you know, have plagued humanity for millennia. And so... Free speech is in the common good. Let's go to another one, due process. Due process is a fundamental aspect of liberalism, fundamental. But nobody would say that due process is a, new, has a, is a morally neutral value. Now, there's a neutral aspect to it that everyone, both the guilty and the innocent, enjoy, enjoy due process. But nobody would say that due process itself is morally neutral. So you can go again and again, freedom from cruel and unusual punishment, um, freedom from self-incrimination, uh, rights of free exercise, rights of assembly. While these are, there are aspects of them that are neutral in the sense that it's their applicability to citizens is neutral. Every citizen enjoys the same rights. The rights themselves are not morally neutral. <laughs> they are morally good in the common good. And it's one reason why liberal democracies have flourished and by and large flourished peacefully with each other uh, to an extraordinary degree. Uh, and, and so to say that there's some sort of tension between the common good and liberalism, I just reject that. Now, I will agree that there is a tension between liberalism and utopianism. I think there's an inherent tension between liberalism and utopianism, uh, and and that's good because liberalism should be at war with utopianism because utopianism is the enemy of human flourishing. Well, this to me seems what's uh, particularly alarming that sticks out to me in Vermeule's essay is his taking of the principles that you've just laid out that are in the Constitution and in the way he discusses them in his essay – 
inverts the entire structure where we're talking about it in the context of um, how we've set up governments among men for these specific purposes. The notion clearly that we are citizens, not subjects. Vermeule is rather naked and clear in talking about rulers and subjects in a way that strikes me as truly antithetical to the understanding of the American experiment that I've always had. Right. And, you know, one of the interesting things is if you're, you know, if you're uh, trying to sort of shrug off the um, Vermeulean argument and, and, and the reaction against the Vermeulean argument, given that it's so lacking of any policy specifics, it's just sort of pearl clutching and hand wringing and he didn't even propose anything, all that. Or uh, even define you know, all the, the common good in a way that would allow us to discuss what he's angling towards. Right. But the language itself is cast in a way that is contrary to our understanding of our, our and uh, contrary to our long held self understanding about who we are within a constitutional republic. So what he's doing is he's writing in a way that I think is rather intentionally designed to inflame while providing. Uh, while providing little substance, so which gives you this sort of plausible deniability, like, why are you pearl clutching? I haven't even, it's not like I proposed a monarchy, but also contains deliberately provocative words that everyone reading it knows are contrary to the American idea of the, of the uh, relationship between citizen and state. And so it's sort of classic trollishness. It says something that is at least um not quite serious enough to merit you know a five alarm emergency but intentionally provocative enough enough that the critique is well earned <laughs> and so there's this there is a it's 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 deliberately inflammatory while being also deliberately vague and i just find i find that to be a uh, shall we say, unhelpful way of engaging with the public. Do you think this is uh, a feature, not a bug, of the temperament of this of nascent movement? Oh, well, this movement is trollish to its core. <laughs> it's mocking and trollish and condescending to its core. So there's sort of a, there are two aspects of it. One is that it is, uh, you know, all of the substantive authoritarianism and and uh, critique of classical liberalism that we've been discussing, but it also has a stylistic element. Now, not everybody has this element. I mean, Patrick Deneen is a, I don't, almost don't even want to use him in the same conversation with some of these guys. He's, he's a guy who's you know, written some really thought-provoking, intellectually serious stuff and engaged in public argument in the best of good faith. So this is not universal, but an awful lot of these guys they combine their authorita authoritarianism with a kind of mocking condescension against dissenters, uh, paired often with personal targeting, uh, which I know quite a bit about, personal targeting designed to make the conversation about the deficiencies, not of just of opposing ideas, but of opposing people, and less about the quality of their own perspective. So that if sort of they can say they can prove that, say, I'm not, you know, in this all against this David Frenchism stuff that occurred last year, that if I'm not up to the task of Western defending Western civilization, uh, then a nation's longing eyes need to turn to them. <laughs> and it's a it's a it's trollish. It's often malicious and uh, frequently in bad faith that kind of walks alongside the substantive philosophical argument in a way that I think is is over time going to be extraordinarily off-putting to people, especially once the era of Trump ends, whenever it does. One final question, since you referenced the, uh, we're almost a year on from Sorhab Sorab Amari's essay against David Frenchism and David Frenchism, I guess, being coined as a, as a thing. Um, in, in the interceding year, um, what, you know, have you made any interesting, uh, learned anything interesting, any um, reflections on that now that we're almost 
a year on any observations that you have? Yeah, you know what? <laughs> there's a couple of things. One is that there were sort of there were always two aspects of the against David Frenchism piece. One, one of them is w- what we've been spending about thirty minutes talking about so far, which is the critique of liberalism that. Uh, from particularly from an integralist perspective, that was and has always been the least popular aspect of the Sora Bamari Adrian Vermeule uh, argument. It is, I think, the probably the number of people who are truly in their camp. Uh, you know, f- I, maybe I was speaking to fifty percent of them in the whole country when when Sora and I had our debate at Catholic University. Um, there's just not that many where I think I found where you found over time was that the real energy uh, surrounding that argument wasn't so much in support of Catholic integralism. What the real energy was in anger at critique of Donald Trump and a sort of a, a, a more sophisticated Christian defense of Donald Trump was where you got the real energy in support of Sorab, not in support of his integralism, but in support of a very pointed critique of, of Trump critics and a Christian argument for Trump that was a little bit different and more weighty than, but judges. And so I think that's where it got a lot of its energy and the more Sorab just began to move and some of his other, his fans began to move away from the fight for Trump and towards the fight for integralism, uh, to borrow a, a, phrase, a, a phrase from the great classic mockumentary Spinal Tap, uh, their appeal got more selective. Uh, they, there was less energy for them the more they moved towards integralism and away from the Christian defense of Trump. That's where the energy really, truly was. It was never in creating a mass movement towards integralism. David French is a senior editor at The Dispatch, the author of the French Press newsletter and the co-host of the Advisory Opinions podcast, also from The Dispatch. David, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thanks so much for having me. As always, thank you so much for listening today. Our podcast team loves putting this show together for you every week, and it's so encouraging to hear back from our listeners. Feedback is super important to me because it lets me know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most, and also how I can improve this show to make sure you're getting the most out of it. You can reach our team at actinline at actin.org, or you can call our office at 616-454-3080. And if you like our show, you know what to do. Leave us those ratings and reviews on the Apple Podcast app and subscribe. Act in Line is on YouTube, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you listen.